Are we ready for human cloning? That's an empirical question about the state of the current science. The more important question is, should we even attempt it? And that's the topic of today's video. Cloning, from both a philosophical and scientific perspective. Before we dive in too deep, let's lay some groundwork. Scientifically speaking, there are three main types of cloning. Therapeutic, gene, and reproductive cloning. Therapeutic cloning. This method aims to create embryonic stem cells for use in medical treatments. It involves the same technique as reproductive cloning, which we'll talk about shortly, called SCNT or somatic cell nuclear transfer. Note that this is nuclear as in the nucleus of a cell, not nuclear as in radiation. The cloned embryo is used to harvest stem cells rather than being implanted to develop into a new organism. These stem cells can potentially be used to regenerate damaged tissues or organs in patients. Gene cloning. This involves copying specific genes or DNA segments. It's widely used in genetic research, medicine, and biotechnology. This is the method typically used to make GMOs and is one of the ways that scientists and companies maximize yield, particularly in agricultural products. The process involves inserting a gene of interest into a vector, like a plasmid vector, which is then introduced into a host organism to produce multiple copies of the gene. Reproductive cloning. This type of cloning produces a new organism that is genetically identical to the donor organism. The most famous example is Dolly the sheep, the first mammal cloned from an adult somatic cell. The process typically involves somatic cell nuclear transfer, where the nucleus of a somatic cell is transferred into the enucleated egg cell. Philosophically, there are two main types of cloning that I want to focus on. Perfect and imperfect cloning. Imperfect cloning would be like cloning your genetics to create an embryo or baby that would grow up with your exact same genetics. This type of cloning is very feasible scientifically and aligns closely with reproductive cloning. Perfect cloning would be like cloning not just your genetics, but also your thoughts, behaviors, and the memories that produce them without error. This type of clone would be practically the exact same age as you upon creation, or at least roughly, depending on how much of the cloning process you both remember. This type of cloning is less scientifically feasible, as it requires a complete accurate replication of the brain's structure and functions, which is far beyond our current capabilities. Cloning would be pretty cool if real, especially perfect cloning, but it opens the doors for a number of philosophical paradoxes. The warp pad paradox. Let's say you step on a warp pad that works by creating a clone of you at the destination and destroying the original. You step onto the warp pad and an identical you steps out on Mars while the Earth version is disintegrated. Is the copy that takes its first step on Mars the same person who took their last steps on Earth? Interestingly, this suffers the same problem as additive reconstruction, which I detail in my video, The Impossible Dream of Shrink Rays. How would you 
retrain all of those memories into your clone's brain. The neurosurgery paradox. Let's say we do create a perfect clone of you, including your memories. Then we perform neurosurgery to swap the brains of you and your clone. Which, if either, is the real you? And would you be able to tell in the moment? Which... which am I? The cloning rights paradox. Let's say you break into a laboratory so that you could create a perfect copy of yourself, including your memories. You, as an individual, are entitled to rights as a citizen of your nation. These rights are typically predicated on the basis of blood or soil. Blood-based citizenship would say that you are born with rights via your bloodline. If your parents were citizens, then so are you. Soil-based citizenship would say that you are a citizen of whatever country owns the patch of dirt that you're born on. In both cases, we are assuming that we are bestowed rights through a traditional birth. But in this scenario, the clone may have memories of your parents, but the clone wasn't actually born in the traditional sense. And so the clone doesn't really have parents in the traditional sense. So how would those rights extend to your clone? Would they? If the clone is a perfect copy of you, then in principle it should have the same memories, thoughts, opinions, and behaviors as you, at least at first. But the question remains, who is held responsible for breaking into the lab? Can your clone be held accountable for your crimes? Do both you and your clone say, get a right to vote? Are you both entitled to your country's social safety net? These paradoxes highlight the obscurity of identity and challenge our preconceived notions. While cloning technologies hold significant potential for scientific and medical advancements, they also propose serious ethical challenges that must be carefully considered. When we're discussing the ethical problems of cloning, I'm going to be focusing on the types of cloning that are possible given the current state of the science. This means we're focusing more so on imperfect cloning. Therapeutic cloning. Huang Wu Suk's fraud and illegal egg acquisition. In 2004 and 2005, a high profile Korean scientist, Huang Wu Suk, claimed to have successfully created human embryonic stem cells through a process called SCNT, which was celebrated as a groundbreaking achievement. However, investigations later revealed that. Most of his research over the years was fabricated and that he had not actually succeeded in creating cloned human stem cells. Huang acquired human eggs unethically and illegally. He coerced junior researchers to donate eggs and paid women for their eggs, sometimes under false pretenses. This exploitation raised ethical concerns not just about the treatment of women in research, but also about the slippery slope of selling off parts of your body. SCNT does not have a high success rate, which means a majority of these eggs were lost in the process, which could be considered a moral and ethical wrong depending on your broader philosophy of personhood. On top of that, there were complications caused by the surgeries that Huang had them undergo for some of these women. The story of Huang Wu Suk's fraud is very interesting and raises many ethical concerns. If you'd like to know more about Huang's fraud and the attempted cover-up of it, I'd highly recommend you check out Bobby Broccoli's deep dive on the topic, link in the description. Genetic Cloning Decreased Biodiversity By selecting for particular genetic traits and genotypes, we would reduce the amount of biodiversity, which is bad for the sake of random mutation. 
a pivotal step in natural selection and would reduce our ability to adapt to changing conditions across generations. Additionally, it could potentially make populations more vulnerable to certain types of diseases. Neo-eugenics Genetic cloning can potentially revive eugenic ideologies, where the goal is to create better humans through genetic selection. This could lead to massive social inequality and discrimination based on genetic traits. Also might have to deal with the consequences of designer babies, and the dynamics between the superior genetically modified population versus the inferior natural population. Furthermore, another problem arises if there is a cost associated with having designer babies. If having designer babies were truly such a benefit that they were more likely to lead successful lives than the unmodified population, then this would serve to exacerbate the wealth gap between those who can afford the procedure and those who can't. Reproductive cloning. Sidestepping sexual selection. We all know about natural selection, but there is another driver of evolution that the scientific community has mostly ignored until relatively recently. Sexual selection. The idea of sexual selection is that natural selection can't account for certain aspects of the traits that we observe in nature. The idea of sexual selection is supposed to help account for these. If natural selection is the idea that traits that are beneficial to survival are more likely to be passed on, then sexual selection is the idea that traits that are beneficial to reproduction are more likely to be passed on. Sexual selection could be entirely sidestepped if this type of cloning were widely available, which is problematic because sexual selection also plays a role in promoting beneficial traits and eliminating harmful ones. Failure rate and health risks. Reproductive cloning has a high failure rate, with many cloned embryos failing to develop properly. This often results in miscarriages, stillbirths, and early deaths of cloned humans and animals. Cloned animals frequently suffer from various health problems, including premature aging, immune deficiencies, and genetic abnormalities. These health issues can significantly reduce the quality of life and lifespan of the clones, not to mention the ethical implications of knowingly creating organisms with a high likelihood of suffering and health problems. These can be viewed as leading to an increase in the amount of suffering in the world, and would therefore be immoral. It looks like that problem took care of itself. <laughs> It was an act of mercy. We know. We do it all the time. Rights and legality. The legal status of cloned organisms, particularly humans, is a complex and unresolved issue. Clones may face unique legal challenges regarding their rights, identity, and status in society. Strict regulatory frameworks are necessary to ensure that cloning practices are conducted ethically and responsibly. At the end of the day, whether or not the benefits and scientific knowledge gained from cloning research is worth pursuing or outweighs the moral and ethical considerations isn't something I can tell you. It's something that everyone will have to consider for themselves.